how are you doing, my guy? Very good, man. Very good. Uh, just coming off of a, a long Fourth of July weekend slash like birthday party slash uh, Scott Fishbowl live draft. Oh, so it's been a it's been a couple sure days you took of the fourth easy. Uh, it, I I should have. I actually should have taken a Scott Fishbowl <laughs> easy because that was the first event, and then you know I had to wake up for my daughter's birthday the next day. But uh, just, just getting I back to normal race. now, and 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 uh, ready to talk some football. So thanks for having me on, guys. Love it. Yep. Thank you for being here, Nick. Let's jump right into it. Talking wide receivers. Now, the general kind of consensus seems to be that wide receivers are devalued a little bit in this scoring because of the way the first downs work. Running backs have opportunities for those first down points running and and uh, receiving wide receivers. Not so much. Do you agree with that take? Um, I, there, there's, there's some truth to it. Some, some, some not, because if we look, you know, I, I was looking on a, NBC Sports Edge, they had a first down data, which you, you know, some people might be interested in uh, with this scoring. But you look at a guy like Jonathan Taylor had 107 first downs. So obviously, like that's like a cheat code in this sort of scoring format. But then you had for the running back position, four guys had 60 to 65, five had 50 to 57. Flip to the wide receiver position, Cup and Adams, 89 and 84, three players at 75, four players somewhere between 60 and 60. Six and then five had 55 to 59. So looking at that 55 plus 10 running backs and 14 wide receivers. So it's not like, you know, I think the first thing we think is like, how do you get a first down from two? You run it in. But at the same time, you know, there's not this massive difference in the amount of running backs hitting certain marks than it is with wide receivers. You know, I'm a big pound the running back guy for redraft or for maybe for tournaments like this anyways, but um, I'm not like fading just because of the scoring setting, just to be honest. With that last little comment, I think I already know your answer to this question, but is zero RB anything that you're interested in in Scott Fishbowl? No, no, I, I'm not interested in Scott Fishbowl and redraft and, and uh, even in Dynasty. But, you know, I looked at my own draft board because uh, I, I went to the live Chicago draft. It was a ton of fun. But uh, in the sixth, seventh round, so if that's going to be our, like, this is what, you know, fading a running back is, waiting till the sixth, seventh, uh, Elijah Mitchell, which I, I actually do like, but then Damian Harris, CEH, Patterson, Dobbins, who has some question marks with him with his injury. So you're kind of getting to a pretty thin area where there's a question mark next to every single one of those guys. So I'd rather either take the approach where I pound two a little bit earlier, or I, I get that anchor guy so that I'm comfortable kind of taking some chances on um, someone from that list. I know you guys just talked about Rashad Penny. Maybe if I grab a, a guy early in uh, this this sort of format and then I wait I don't know later and take like a Rashad Penny and and a guy like uh, Chase Edmonds who, who I like or somebody later like that where I'm kind of stacking um, and waiting in that sense but just fading completely to the sixth or seventh looking at my draft board it gets really really ugly so I, I you know I guess it depends on how your board is going and the funny thing is with the live Scott Fishbowl was that when you looked at all three boards we had the stickers up they were three completely different boards. So it comes down to playing your board a little bit, but uh, I'm not into fading in all honesty. Yeah. Now I know Herms is also lover of the running back. So I'm sure he's not really interested in the zero RB draft too much. Personally, I am someone who tends to lean that way in my drafts into mm -hmm. the zero RB hero RB types of drafts. I'll say for Scott Fishbowl, not feeling it as much, but I'll say for those of the people out there who do enjoy that draft strategy, all I can say is to not force it for the Scott Fishbowl. If the draft doesn't call for it, don't do it. Uh, you know, we all have to be water, as they say. Skylar, do you have any thoughts on zero RB, hero RB types of strategies for Scott Fishbowl? So it's not my personal strategy, right? Last year, I hammered. I told you I went Nick Chubb, DeAndre Swift, Najee Harris. Like, I was comfortable not taking a wide receiver until rounds like seven, eight, took – Later, I took Amari Cooper, Michael Pittman, Amon Ross St. Brown. But if you are going to go wide receiver, if you are going to pass running back, right, and go wide receivers or take all running backs early and fade wide receivers late, the type of wide receiver I'm looking to target is more of the slot wide receivers for this format, right? I was just looking at, in a broad scope, right, what percentage on targets wide receivers get first downs at, and – the, the position, a wide receiver position where the majority of those first downs come from, I found, are kind of out of the slot, right? These guys get and accumulate a lot of first downs. It's what gives a guy like Cooper Cup 
such a boost over these other wide receivers. It's not just that he catches a lot of balls. It's where he's catching these balls, right? I know with wide receivers, for the most part, every catch is a first down. But it's a lot of these guys, Keenan Allen, Brandon Cooks, Stephon Diggs, you know, way later you're talking maybe your Jacoby Myers, your Hunter Renfro's, or even later a name I really like is uh, Jamison Crowder as these guys who are probably going to catch a lot more balls than you think, right, versus your guys like DK Metcalf who might – he can get 40 yards on one catch. That's not worth as much in this format as the guy who's picking up, you know, um, four first downs to get his 40 yards. So those are the type of wide receivers really that I'm most interested in with this format, and I'm I'm a lot more interested in waiting and taking those guys. Or if I am going early, I'm going to be targeting – I'm going to be targeting Stefan Diggs. I'm going to be targeting, um, obviously, Cooper Cup if he's there early second round. Um, obviously, you have your studs, Justin Jefferson, Mike Evans. They catch a lot of first downs, too. But the, the, those are those are the guys that I, I really do like, and I think it does give them a big boost, right? You're talking about these some of these later wide receivers and especially slot receivers. Jacoby Myers is someone who I'm really interested in because I think he's going to lead them in targets, lead them in catches. I think he's going to catch a lot of first downs. going to be a safety valve for – Mac Jones to get those first downs. So he's someone I'm really interested in late. Herms, do you have a wide receiver in particular that you're looking at late? Oh, well, Wyatt, it's funny you ask because we have this guy in common. So but I love talking about it. It's one of my new favorite memes that I've been pushing out on the timeline consistently, asking people to join the Jalen Tolbert hype train. It is just like, it, there's so much room still left if you want to board the train. And it's going to be wonderful because like, at the earliest, like, Michael Gallup could come back in, you know, September at some time, maybe October. But, like, dude, he tore his ACL pretty late in the year in Dallas. And, like, it's going to be a pretty robust passing attack. And, like, yes, CeeDee Lamb is still there. Yes, Dalton Schultz is still there. But, like, Jalen Tolbert's, like, really good at playing football. <laughs> and it's kind of, like, one of the best opportunities you could just walk immediately into for early production. So it's, like... I mean, even when Gallup does kind of come back and gets himself ready to go, like if Tolbert does well enough, they'll figure it out. I don't know. Like, I, I think Dallas is going to be a pretty fun offense to target no matter what you're doing. So, like, bro, Jalen Tolbert's my guy with that for sure. And then also, like, man, I, I've heard some rumblings. Uh, you know, my premium subscription to The Athletic, really, really helpful. Uh, talking about in Steelers camp, uh, they're having George Pickens kind of just do the uh, old Juju Smith-Schuster stuff. So if you feel better about his ability to actually be able to, you know, kind of break through and, you know, run more than, you know, like a foot and a half in front of him after he catches the ball, that's a guy. That's a guy. I, anytime I can hype up the Steelers, I will. But, like, two rookies right there, Pickens and Tolbert, solid stabs to take late. You'll get no pushback from me on Jalen Tolbert. I know you know that. If, if you see me on Twitter anytime <laughs> recently, you'll see me talk about Jalen Tolbert. And that's some very interesting news about Pickens. Nick. Do you have some wide receivers that you're thinking about late that you really like? So yeah, I got a, I got a couple that come to mind. Uh, not not super late. I, I took him in in the tenth, so that's not super late. But I I, I really do like Kadarius Tony this year, and I think he might even have fell into the eleventh if if I didn't take him. But talking about a guy, you know, yards after the catch upside, uh, receiving upside could be their primary target. There's a chance for that. So I, I do like Tony. Uh, I got him in the tenth. Um, late, later on, uh, speaking of rookies, big Dotson guy, personally, um, I know some people knocked, you know, uh, maybe his breakout age and maybe some size things, but he's absolutely torching camp right now. The coaching staff's talking about him a lot. Carson Wentz is, you know, 98.5 yards per game his last season. He was, uh, you know, a, a college leader in, in receiving and receptions, you know, top 20 in those categories. I, I really like Dotson. I like what's been coming out of camp and he, He's a guy I feel like people are starting to think about a little bit more. He went in the uh, the late 13th of the, the live draft I did. Um, you know, uh, the slot guys were mentioned. Tyler Boyd, to be interesting to see where he goes. I know he's not the primary guy or even the secondary guy, but he, like, I think his ADP right now for a redraft is like 50-something, even though he just finishes the wide receiver 29. But he was number one in slot snaps. So if you like a slot guy, Tyler Boyd's uh, another one that comes to mind. So just a uh, – couple guys thrown out you know obviously tony's more expensive than than boyd boyd might be around or a little bit more expensive than dotson but those three guys kind of stand out to me as people that maybe don't get uh the looks that uh some of these other names that have been on the the twitter sphere uh have been lately dotson is definitely a favorite of the jwb team so we're on board with that one for sure 
And, you know, I want to talk about some of these injured, injured slash suspended wide receivers because we actually have a good amount of them uh, going into the year. The first one I'm going to ask about is Jamison Williams. Herms, do you like Jamison Williams coming to this year? I mean, we don't, we don't know when we're going to see him, similar to like Michael Gallup, like you mentioned earlier. We don't really know when he's going to be on the field. Do you have any thoughts there? I did the exact same. Well, not because he was injured, but just taking a uh, rookie, rookie wide receiver just late, just on the off chance it works out with his new teammate, Amon Ross St. Brown. That worked out just fine. Because, like, the greatest thing that Jamison Williams has going for him is that the only real competition he has, just in the wide receiver room specifically, yes, I understand TJ Hawkinson didn't just spontaneously explode, and that, you know, DeAndre Swift does catch passes, but like the only competition he faces in the wide receiver room is Amon Ross St. Brown. And they're going to be doing different things anyway. So it's not like they're going to be, you know, overlapping to perform the same role in the field anyway. So like, yeah, dude, if he returns to health, I mean, there was, you know, I wasn't one of these people, but there was, you know, a fairly sizable amount of people that made the case for him being the number one receiver in the draft, the guy that people thought should be first off the board. And it's like, you know, okay, I get it. You know, he's not just a big play guy either. I think he kind of has that reputation. But even if you go back and look at some of what he was able to pull off at Alabama, I mean, he can run some stuff in the intermediate and really do a lot with just he, – he's not just the one-trick pony. And in a situation where he's going to have to deal with having Jared Goff as his quarterback, who, mind you, at times in the past has been able to support multiple fantasy viable wide receivers. Yes, we think differently because like, ah, it's Detroit, it's horrible. <laughs> but if talent's there, like you can't argue with that. And this will be a pretty good group of receivers and pass catchers he has to work with. So like, yeah, absolutely take a shot on that. Because if it doesn't work out, what? I don't, 16th round, 17th round, whatever incredibly late pick you're spending on it, just cut it and, you know, Pick up somebody off the waiver wire. Find a kicker. I don't know. Like, you're not really shooting yourself in the foot if it goes wrong. But if it goes right, then play them. You know, you're really going to you're gonna have some fun. So my only comment on that with with Jameson Williams, right, is with, with this tournament, you say, oh, if it doesn't work out, cut him. He's probably missing the first three to four weeks, right? So you're burning oh, yeah. a roster oh, sure. spot to begin with. You're holding. And then he's he's a rookie at that point, right? You don't draft rookies. And if they don't perform in the first three games, you cut them. It's okay. So let's say he misses four games. I'm going to give him three to – I'm going to give him a month to show me if he can incorporate so this offense. Suddenly it's week nine or ten, Herms. And we're talking – we're talking playoffs, right? There's only 11 weeks of regular season, right? Even if he, if he pops off at the end, I think it's too late for me for James Williams that I'm sitting around waiting. And even if he does come on, I don't think he's the type of player who's going to be coming in and get it done like Jalen Waddle, where it's going to be a crazy amount of targets, right? Does, do you think James, I mean, James Williams plays, he, let's say he plays 13, 12, 13, 14 games this year, does he catch more than 50 balls? I, I'm i not sure that he does that. And for that reason, I don't think he offers you a huge amount of uh, I don't have a huge, I don't have a lot of confidence that he's going to give you that huge upside that you're talking about. I think between him and DJ Shark, you probably get one usable football player for the season, and I, I just don't love that. I don't hate the long term prospect with Jameson Williams, but this isn't dynasty football. All right, we're talking about 2022, and I just I'm just not a fan of him for immediate for that immediate upside. I think he just burns more of a roster spot, and if and if he does pop off, I'm okay being wrong because he is going in a spot in the draft where there's a lot of wide receivers I think offer similar upside. It's, yeah, about, that's kind it's of, about risk oh, tolerance, yeah. right? <laughs> no, go ahead, Herbs. Come back in. No, it's just like like the the quickly, like it's the frustrating thing about just why did he have to get hurt when he did? Like it's just like no matter where he was gonna end up being drafted to, this was going to be the reality. And like that is kind of like the ultimate point about Jameson Williams. Like, you know, like I painted the rosy version of it, but you know, to your point, like that is kind of the reason you have to be wary of it, is because the timeline is pushed so much because it just <laughs> had to happen in the championship game it just had to happen at the worst possible time oh it makes me sad right, i'm a transition now, moving on to another were... wide receiver oh go ahead scott you got some i was else. about to well, you brought up jalen tober you brought up your han dotson it got me thinking rookies and uh i want to shout out first david bell because as far as a wide receiver who could see a lot of targets right away um this, this, I think, is a little more contingent on how much of Deshaun Watson we see play. I think David Bell could be a type of guy who, at the end of the season, has Amra light upside where he's just catching a lot of passes for you in your lineup. But the guy I want to talk about where 
His situation is a little foggy to start, but who could really pop on late, depending on how well some of these veterans do. If some of these veterans even play football this year, is Chris Olave. Right? He's the type of guy who's going around that Kadarius Tony zone. We're talking around 10 or later, or roughly. And he's the type of water receiver where I think late, late in the year, he could be catching a lot of passes. He could be coming in and he could be a dependable target for Jameson. Uh, for Jameis Winston, um, depending on what version of Jarvis Lynch we see, you know, he's, he's 30 years old. And if Michael Thomas even plays football, because there's no guarantee every, every time you go see him, he's doing drills by himself. Um, they're talking, uh, he should be ready for the season. Is he committed to the team? It's a headache that I'm, I'm quite frankly, I'm sick of. And recency bias would tell me that I can't depend on Michael Thomas, but for, so for those reasons, I think Chris Olave is a talented wide receiver, who's capable of handling, um, you know, a lot of targets who could step in and be very usable for Scott Fishbowl as you're getting into playoff season. Let, let's stay with the Saints there and talk Michael Thomas, Nick, another player who we don't really know when we're going to see him. Do you have thoughts on Michael Thomas? Yeah, I the, the, the issue with me and, and Michael Thomas is, you know, when you talk about guys like this, you always try to dig as, as much as possible on, on Twitter, see if there's anything with camp. Um, June 14th, Thomas Ankle didn't participate during Tuesday's mandatory mini camp practice. I might have missed something after that, but you know, every time I try to uh, dig more into Michael Thomas, you always get these questions of why is it taking so long to come back to football? And you know, I looked up there was I don't I don't remember his name. There's a doctor on Twitter who talks a lot of stuff about uh, fantasy football players, but he was talking about the type of an ankle injury that it was and how it delays him. But I, I you take a risk with with a guy like Michael Thomas, or we talked about Jameson Williams, who who I also do you know like as a player. But I think you need to be careful with the way you build your team around the risky picks like that because if you wait on wide receiver a bit and then you take a risky pick and then you wait again after you take another guy or two and now you're pretty bleak and you're really throwing darts for somebody that you might have to start now on a weekly basis, then it's a pretty terrible game plan in my opinion. If you go wide receiver a little bit early, you take a break, you take a risky guy and then you back it up with somebody that um, is maybe not you know an elite option but an option that can you know s- slot into your lineup every week, that's, that's an- another thing. So Michael Thomas, in all honesty, for me, I don't have a ton of interest in as of right now because I I don't I know the the you know high risk high reward he could bring because the last time he had a full season he was amazing, but I also like I I hate burning draft picks so really roster dependent also for me how I build my team. He's really tough. Like last year, he reminds me a lot of uh, last year's a guy Michael Thomas, where. <laughs> Where we were waiting on him, and we never, we never got him. Or another guy like that could be like Odell Beckham Jr., who's yeah. once we're like oh, he's going to play, and then it was just a headache in out lineup. Didn't really know. Obviously, his relationship with the team isn't isn't the best, and it's really hard to depend in that same range. I'm probably preferring DeAndre Hopkins if I'm going to take that risk on a veteran wide receiver. I think I'm more comfortable in this type of format, taking DeAndre Hopkins. I'll throw that back to Herms. Where are you at on DeAndre Hopkins? Both those players, Michael Thomas and John Hopkins, go around that 8-9 turn in your draft. So from what they've done in the past, it could be a huge, huge, uh, huge W for points per game, or it could end up completely uh, face planning. Where, where are you on DeAndre Hopkins versus Michael Thomas? Yeah, I mean, I was really nervous about what this year was going to be like for DeAndre Hopkins before they ended up making the trade for Hollywood Brown. And then before, you know, some other things kind of happened around him and all of a sudden Deandre Hopkins has become a lot more appealing. Cause it's like, okay, at least we definitively know once this suspension's over, the man's coming back. Theoretically, he will be healthy. Whereas Michael Thomas is like, uh, Oh, maybe he'll be great. <laughs> ready to go right away. Or, we don't ever see him in a Saints uniform again. Like that range of outcomes is huge. I I'm not trying to play that game. So like, well, and then also just the fact that like he has actually played with the quarterback that will be throwing him the ball. <laughs> you know, like that, that to me is the biggest part of the whole thing. Cause like Michael Thomas is fabulous in theory, but we haven't really seen him in this iteration of the New Orleans offense. So, like, give me the guy that has familiarity with what's going to be going on around him. 
actually has a concrete return. And then also just when they're both healthy, I mean, you're kind of picking between Hopkins and Michael Thomas anyway. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like we did that for a very long time, not so long in the distant past. So like, I don't know. Yes. Like Hopkins for sure at this point has become one of those guys where it's like, if I really, really nail it early on in the draft and I just want to give myself that little just extra nitrous boost for when he finally comes back for my lineup, dude, dude, 100%. Yeah, you nailed that one for me, Herms, with the, he actually just played with his quarterback. <laughs> you know, we haven't seen <laughs> Michael Thomas with Jameis Winston yet. That, that's that's it for me. <laughs> Nick, what do you think? When he comes in, uh, oh. Hollywood Brown is – like what he's, he's that Christian Kirk role. So like we know DeAndre Hopkins role was there too. So Nick, yeah. Roster construction again. I mean, I, I like, I do like that point about um, uh, the familiarity with the quarterback. Um, if you compare the two guys across their careers, you can uh, talk highly, obviously about both guys. Um, six weeks though, you, I, you're going to have to make sure that, I don't know. You know, I, I have, I have such a tough time me personally, because I, I have like such a, I'm a terrible loser. I'm a sore loser. Uh, it's probably like an athlete mentality, but like I, I go in every single week is just extremely important to me and redraft or some of these tournaments. And I know if, if guys like Hopkins fall down the board to a certain uh, round, it's going to pay off for you in, in the long run, hopefully. But I just struggle to like miss guys for six weeks or miss guys for, maybe the whole season or, or take those chances. And I know fantasy is about chances at times, but I don't know. I'm, I'm maybe, I'm not saying I'm a hundred percent out. I guess it depends where he falls, but I'm also saying that I, I avoid these situations. Like J I'm, we're not talking running backs, but JK Dobbins, the closer we get to the season is making me more and more nervous for where I have him because every week's important to me. And I don't want to wait on guys for, for the season. So Hopkins, I, me personally, I'm, I'm, I'm probably not drafting in all honesty. I, I think I just, I'd pivot to, to building the strongest roster that can last me 17 weeks and all that's, that's, that's me. You're probably going to be echoing yourself here though, then, but I'll, I'll toss another name out there. A guy who's six weeks would be optimistic. It looking like it could be as much as 11 through the bye week which could be your entire Scott Fishbowl season. I'm talking Chris Godwin, a guy who's ADP is higher than Michael Thomas and Deandre Hopkins. How do we feel about, yeah, Herms is saying no. Well, I'm still seeing Chris Godwin going rounds five, six. Set the set set the record straight. Set the record straight, guys. What are we doing with Chris Godwin? I'm I'm not touching Godwin. I don't want to cut anybody off, but his his ADP. I'm just looking on like Herms was wearing the hat. Fan, fantasy Pros. Obviously, it's not Scott Fishbowl. Uh, it's redraft wide receiver twenty one. In 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 my opinion, the Bucks want to win a championship this year. The Bucks, I don't think care as much about making sure they win week three. I think that obviously every week they're going to want to go out and get the result, but they're a good enough team, even with Chris Godwin out, even with Gronk not coming back, that they don't need to force him to play early. I think they want him for the actual playoffs at 100% versus bring him back too early, then he's banged up again for the playoffs, or bring him back a little early, now he's only like 80% for the playoffs. So I see a world, and, and I could be wrong here, but I, I see a world where you think he's out five weeks and it's going to be like nine weeks. And that's a chance I don't want to take it at, at this price that he's at. Cause he does go high for a reason. I just don't understand. Yeah. So uh, you heard it there. Yeah, I, I'm not taking Chris Godwin. I'm not touching him anywhere. Yeah. Um, it's so t Because of the old deal, the 11 week regular season, that's the breaking point here. Uh, I've been interested in Chris Godwin in best ball drafts leading up to this point at cost uh, because trying to win that tournament. Right. But mm -hmm. The playoffs is later than week 12 in those best ball drafts. When he's potential, he's out for almost the entire time it takes you to get to the playoffs. It's a really tough pill to swallow. So I'm going to throw out three names to you, Herms. Tell me if you're going to sniff any of these three names. The first name is going to be Michael Gallup, who could miss three or four weeks. You touching him. I I care too deeply for Jalen Tolbert to say yes. So okay. <laughs> the next yeah. name you throw is John Mechie. He's he's probably going to miss the first two weeks. I would say is a a safe estimate. Are you interested at you, all in John Mechie? The only player on the Houston Texans I am even remotely interested in that's not Davis Mills is Brandon Cooks. Outside of that, I don't care for any of them. And the last name I'm going to throw is Sterling Shepard, who. Who knows when, if all, he plays football again. But when he's out there, he catches passes. How are we, are we sniffing him? 
at the very end, I I will I will genuinely consider that because it's either it's either him or Kadarius Tony. I don't think it would because Kenny Galladay is irrelevant to me at this point, just completely. I'm not I don't think about him ever until just now. This is probably the first time I've thought about him. So sure, last pick maybe, but I'm not thinking much beyond that. No. Yeah. All right. To close out wide receivers, Nick. Last one of your last picks. Are you even thinking about guys who aren't even on football teams? We're talking Odell Beckham Jr., Cole Beasley, Will Fuller. It is July. I, what are your thoughts on any of those three guys? The one guy, and I'll I'll take the heat for it, but the, there was games last year, last year where he was healthy and he had really nice weeks. I think in the playoffs he was decent too. I'll still, and I'll I'll take the E for it. I'll still, with the last pick, take a shot on Julio because I think there's a chance Ooh, that he yeah. ends up in 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 Green Bay. And if that's if that's what happens, is is ADP is going to change? And if you get you know half the season healthy, Julio, he was good in some games last year. People always say he's dust. Well, he was hurt. I think I think we always you know forget to draw the line between that. Sometimes it kind of intersects, but. I'll take a shot on Julio landing in uh, landing in Green Bay. There you go. I love that shout because, I mean, on MFL app, you might not even see Julio's name in there. And we're talking one of your last couple picks. We're talking yeah. pass round 15. Like, so I, I, I love the shout. So, Herms, I'm going to give you a big thank you for coming on, talking running backs, wide receivers. So I, I really appreciate you. With that, I'm going to intro our, our next guest who's hopping on who's going to – Come give her us her expertise.